the game and this conversation is a preview of a world in which if Iran goes nuclear, Saudi Arabia will go nuclear, Turkey will go nuclear, I would think Egypt would go nuclear, maybe the UAE, and I, you know, at least South Korea and probably Japan. It's difficult to know how the story ends. We know how it begins. I think it begins here. I'm Roland Oliphant, and this is Battle Lines. We cannot allow ourselves to become numb to the suffering, and I will not be silent. President Zelensky has for the first time acknowledged that his forces are conducting a cross-border offensive inside Russia. I just find bombs and I find dead people, but it's a really scary thing for me. If I had not moved my head at that very last instant, the assassin's bullet would have perfectly hit its mark. On today's episode, I speak to foreign correspondent Ben Farmer for the latest updates from Lebanon, where Israel is expanding its ground offensive against Hezbollah. Then I speak to US academic Henry Sikolsky about fears a direct conflict between Israel and Iran could escalate to a nuclear war. It's Friday, the 11th of October, 2024. This week, Israel continued airstrikes and extended its ground of invasion of Lebanon and its war with Hezbollah. It also launched a new offensive against Hamas in northern Gaza, and Benjamin Netanyahu consulted with Joe Biden about Israel's planned retaliation against Iran for last week's massive missile strike. I started by speaking to The Telegraph's Ben Farmer, who is in Lebanon, about the week's developments. I asked him about the latest from Beirut and what he found when he went down to Tyre, a city just 12 miles from the Israeli border in the heart of the battle zone. Ben, you're in Beirut. We are now about 10 days, roughly, into the Israeli ground invasion of Lebanon, two weeks into an intensified airstrike campaign. What can you tell us? What is the latest from, from there where you are? Well, uh, both those elements of the Israeli offensive are very much ongoing. So as you say, Israel stepped up its airstrikes about two and a half weeks ago, then launched a ground invasion about 10 days ago. This Israel's intention is to stop rockets falling on its own northern towns, rockets fired by Hezbollah inside Lebanon. Now Israel is continuing to strike Lebanon very hard every day. The Lebanese authorities say that in that time, about 15,000 are dead. There are airstrikes every day. Somewhere around about a million, maybe slightly more, have left their homes in that time. But Hezbollah is still firing rockets. Only yesterday, two Israelis were killed by a rocket strike fired from Lebanon. So the situation is that it's still going on. And really, Lebanon and the Lebanese are in a very difficult situation. You're in Beirut, I believe, which is quite a long way from the, the front line, the scene of the kind of the epicenter of this down in the south on the Israeli border. But what can you see around there? How is it affecting things in the capital? Yes, so Beirut is about uh, 50, 60 miles maybe from the Israeli border. But the, the southern suburbs of Beirut, which are a Hezbollah stronghold, are being hit every day. So there are significant airstrikes in Beirut every day. We often hear them. As I'm speaking to you now, there is a buzz in the sky, which everyone tells me is an Israeli drone. So uh, we see columns of smoke rising from the southern suburbs every day. And what can you tell us about the progress of the battle on the ground? It's very difficult to get close to for, for obvious reasons, I suppose. But what's our understanding of, of the amount of progress the Israelis have made, whether they're achieving their goals and how far they've come into the country? Well, as you say, we, it is difficult. It's impossible to get very close. All we know is that the Israelis have said that there they are, there's, their uh, offensive is limited and targeted and really is raids. Um, we don't know how far they've come into the country. We know the troops from four divisions have pushed over the border. And we've seen various estimates as to what that might mean. 
of somewhere between 10 and 15,000 troops. Now, as to that is whether that is being effective, I think the proof has to be in the pudding according to Israel's own objectives, and that is to stop the rockets. And as we are at the moment, the rockets are still being fired. So they have not met their own goals yet. Um, so, Ben, you, you've you've been down to Tyre, which is a, a port city. It's south of Beirut. It's it, it's getting down towards that southern um, battle zone, I suppose. Uh, could you tell us about about that reporting trip? What did what did you see and what did you encounter? Yeah, so Tyre is about twelve miles from the Israeli border, and we went down uh, for a couple of days. It is an area that has been uh, subject to Israeli evacuation orders. And Tyre is really uh, a very historic city. It boasts being one of the longest continuously inhabited settlements in the world. But at the moment, it's almost empty and it's being struck regularly by Israeli airstrikes. So when we were there, we saw a lot of evidence of strikes. We saw two strikes at close hand, one of them about 100 yards from us when we were visiting a hospital. And we saw lots of strikes in the hills to the south of the city. So this really was for our own evidence of being able to see what is going on in Southern Africa. Mm. Did you speak to any of the locals there? What was the, the mood or the sentiment that you encountered? Yes, we did speak to people, but I have to say it was difficult because there were Hezbollah minders trying to go with us wherever we went. And it wasn't at all clear if people were able to talk to us freely. But it was clear that the city was being struck repeatedly. We seem to have lost Ben. The We understand the power has just gone out in that part of Beirut and the internet's gone with it. So we're just going to try and reach Ben by voice message. What could you just, what, what just happened? Are you, are you all right? Everything fine down there? Yes, there was just a power cut in my part of Beirut. Everything's fine. I'm fine. It's just a reminder, I suppose, these power cuts are not unusual. And it's a reminder that what is happening to Lebanon comes on top of its own domestic troubles. Before the war, it's been suffering from quite difficult economic and political difficulties. And the war has just come on top of that. Ben, you were just telling us before you were cut off about uh, the Lebanese response to Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, address, uh, basically telling them to overthrow Hezbollah or face a very long Gaza-style war? Well, publicly, the response to Netanyahu's ultimatum is defiance, uh, telling him to keep out of their business and not to threaten them. But of course, people are worried. They've seen the destruction in Gaza. They've also seen their powerlessness in the face of what Israel is doing launching strikes on their territory and launching ground operations. So the idea that this could go on and there is more destruction, and more devastation, is very worrying. But also the idea that they can just easily rise up and oust Hezbollah, even if they wanted to, is, is far-fetched, they say. And as one analyst put it to me, what in fact Netanyahu is offering is a choice between their country being turned into another Gaza and civil war if they try and oust Hezbollah. But we've spoken a lot about the Israeli position on this and, and Benjamin Netanyahu's public statements and so on. Where exactly are Hezbollah on this? Have we heard from them? Are they making themselves known? They've obviously lost, well, they lost Hassan Nasrallah, that we believe they've lost at least one, possibly two or more of his replacements. Are they able or effective to still operate? Are you seeing them around? Are they making um, public statements? I mean, are, are, do they remain a, a present and operating force, as far as you can tell? I haven't seen an official uh, response to Netanyahu's comments from Hezbollah leadership. And that might not be surprising because uh, after Hassan Nasrallah and many of his deputies have been killed in airstrikes, they have not surprisingly gone to ground. But the organization remains deeply entrenched in the Lebanese state and in Lebanese society, I think. And it's far too early to say that the two and a half weeks of Israel's operations 
have destroyed it. We don't know yet how damaged it is and how it might be able to recover or not and how weakened it might be and whether that weakness might make it susceptible to either internal rivalry or rivalry from other factions, other political factions in the country. That's really what everyone is waiting to see. But certainly when we were in Tyre, we did see plenty of lower level Hezbollah functionaries, if you like, and they still very much do have a presence on the ground. I was wondering if you could give our listeners just a, a little sense of, of the challenges you're facing with reporting there at the moment. Every every war zone's different. War reporting always has its challenges. But I was just wondering if, if you could give us a sense of, you know, the challenges you're facing in, in this particular scenario. I think the difficulties we're facing are uh, getting close to where these operations are going on to see for ourselves what's happening. Um, much of the south of the country has been evacuated. In fact, we're told today by the UN that a quarter of the whole of Lebanese territory is subject to Israeli displacement orders. And also, going to these places, really there's a lot of paranoia um, among Hezbollah. They're not keen for journalists to go and work um, on their own. They often ask questions and they really don't want you to go to these places unless they supervise it. The other thing that is, of course, in a condition like this, a lot of people are very scared, a lot of people are very worried, tensions are high, there's a lot of paranoia, and that means that understandably, people are very reluctant to talk to the media. As Israel considers its response to Iran's missile strikes, one option is bombing Iran's nuclear facilities to prevent the Islamic Republic from finally acquiring a nuclear bomb. Others have warned that such a strike could be counterproductive, encouraging Iran to rush for a bomb and raising the nightmarish prospect of a nuclear exchange with Israel, which already has, but does not acknowledge, its own nuclear arsenal. Henry Sikorsky, the executive director of the Non-Proliferation Policy Education Center in Washington, recently ran a war game looking at exactly that scenario. I asked him what prompted him to run that war game what we know about Israel's secretive nuclear program, and whether nuclear war in the Middle East is now closer than we think. Here's our conversation. Henry, thank you for joining us. I'm going to try and read an introduction for you. Tell me if I've got it right. You are Henry Sokolsky, your executive director of the Non-Proliferation Policy Education Center, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, a, a, a national security think tank? Would that be a fair way of describing it? Yeah. Fantastic. Henry, thank you very much for joining us. We, we wanted to speak to you largely because of some of the, the very interesting research you've been doing in terms of non-proliferation in the Middle East. Back in February, you ran a war game simulating a nuclear exchange between Israel and Iran. And that is a scenario that, I mean, at the time, maybe that seemed slightly alarmist perhaps but but right now we're right on the brink of a of, of direct iran israeli confrontation it, it seems like a scenario that is perhaps closer than ever so before we get into that game and how it went and, and what it told you can you just tell us why did you decide to to run it why did you feel the need to do this bit of research well I, my outfit is not large i'd like to say that what what I lack in uh, numbers with regard to staff, I make up both in contracting and persistence. This is our 30th year of operation. Operating, I might add, without an endowment. It's just basically coming up with ideas that charitable foundations are attracted enough to to keep us floating. I have a small staff. So, you know, doing what others do doesn't quite cut it for my organization, I can't, I can't survive doing that. I have to come up with something someone isn't doing and that the government ought to be doing, but probably isn't. And having served in the government, legislative branch and the Pentagon, you know, I have an inkling of how things don't get done. So when I encountered a conversation of former officials about 
oh, I don't know, two years, three years ago, in which it was just glibly uh, noted that, well, you know, one thing we surely wouldn't bother talking about is Israel using nuclear weapons. That was forbidden. A little light went on. Oh, well, if it's forbidden, uh, maybe that's what, you know, our next project should be. I started scratching at it and discovered that something I already knew, but I hadn't thought about. There is a regulation uh, that says that if you have a clearance, you can lose your clearance or be subject to discipline if you mention that Israel has nuclear weapons in public. And it dawned on me that that alone might have prevented certainly public gaming to a very great extent, but maybe it even warded off gaming within the government. And I started scratching at that. I got the impression that I might be right on that front. I, I can't prove it. I, I don't. I no longer hold my clearances. I, mean, I worked in the Pentagon, as I mentioned. So in any case, I, I scoured the, the landscape and discovered no one had gamed it publicly. So I wanted to get into it. So that was the first instinct. The second instinct, and there are only two that I played upon, is that there was a, a conspiracy of conservatism with regard to thinking about Israel and Iran and war. I mean, the, the conventional wisdom, uh, we played the game uh, last December, almost uh, almost a year ago. And the conventional wisdom then was, well, Israel and Iran are too smart to attack one another openly. They'll do it with, you know, Mossad agents assassinating people then denying it. Or proxies, and and they would never really want to go to war with nuclear weapons because of uh, the uncontrollable quality of that. Well, I think that alone argued for framing a game that took on those assumptions directly. And and in you know at least two or three months before any missiles flew towards one another, the game assumed that would happen, and that turned out to be correct. So you know we're one for two. I hope I'm wrong about the second one. I, I think I think we all we all hope that too. Just 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 for the benefit of listeners to just set the to to set the scenario in the basics here. So the presumption is that Israel has a nuclear arsenal. Everybody writes about it, speaks about it as if that is a fact. Um, but Israel has never admitted to having it. Uh, maintains a policy of ambiguity. Um, neither confirms nor denies. You're saying that um, in the American government, there's also an executive order that, that basically bans American officials from discussing it in public um, as well. Could you just give our listeners, you know, as far as you know, what do we know? What is known about the, the Israeli nuclear weapons program and arsenal? What, what, what do we know about it? Well, the I, I, the ironic thing is that the Israelis, in their own press, talk quite a lot about it, and they say, as long as they say, well, foreign reports indicate that, there the censor will let it through more often than not. They've had programs where they show the underground facilities in detail at Demona for making nuclear weapons on television. I mean, it was the very sort of thing that we would not do. They've done, and they do quite a lot of. So there's that. It, it certainly is the case, in addition, that we have, if you will, an Israeli employee who decided to reveal with pictures uh, in the 80s in the British press the weapons might consist of because he took a picture of models, mock-ups of uh, their weapon. And it, you know, if you, if you know a fair amount and you look at those pictures, it, it looks as though they have mastered pretty advanced fission weapons, including what's called boosting, where you use a little bit of thermonuclear fuel to spike the number of neutrons and the number of fission generations that occur. So it, we know that they, they, they have pretty sophisticated weapons. But it, we, it's not clear to everybody, and that's, that suggests it may not be clear, that they have what are called two-stage thermonuclear weapons. You know, the jury might be out on that front. As far as the numbers are concerned, that is quite a, uh, a you know a raffle ticket proposition. What I mean by that is there's a fair amount of uncertainty. The low numbers are somewhere around a hundred. The high numbers are like four hundred. 
Is this is this numbers of numbers of warheads you're talking about? Yes, yes. And th now that that tells you that our intelligence and what they're willing to share with us is not as good as I think it might be. Let's say between the United States and Great Britain, even though I suspect at this point the military alliance relationship between the United States and Israel is almost as warm, if not warmer, than that of uh, our relations with the UK. <laughs> uh, but there you have it. We don't know as much. Okay. So so there we are. We're, we're, we're fairly sure the Israelis have this nuclear arsenal. You said between somewhere between 100 and 400 warheads. We're not quite sure what kind of warheads, but you're saying fairly sophisticated ones. Let's let's then get into this game. If I read it through correctly, I did I did read the the paper you put out after this. The scenario, I believe, starts in 2027, and the Israelis receive intelligence that Iran is mating nuclear warheads to long-range missiles. Can you take it from there? What was the what did they have to do from then? I I, I would prefer that we back up just a little. Sure. Uh, they. They actually, there are a couple of steps before that, and that that there are a number of rather massive conventional missile exchanges, which now wouldn't seem odd at all, you know, since we read the headlines today. So, you know, that was pretty well anticipated in this game, which is kind of surprising to me. I mean, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe everybody else knew that was going to happen. I didn't. But because of those things are getting fairly dire already with the missile strikes. The icing on the cake that raises the level of concern and the crisis is where you entered in, which is then on top of that, after so many exchanges that are non-nuclear, they discover, oh my gosh, they're getting ready to make nuclear weapons in earnest. And so having, having learned that, the Israelis come to the United States asking for help to knock out as many of the nuclear targets that they, that they know of and that we know of, and that they don't feel they can take them out with conventional weapons unless they have very high speed hypersonic weapons. And so the United States says, well, we don't want to get dragged into this war, but we'll quietly transfer these weapons and you can do whatever you need to do. And so they do. However, it's not clear that it, that it took out what it is they wanted it to take out. And they continue to get reports from their human intelligence sources that indeed the program of mating nuclear warheads to missiles is occurring in places they didn't target. And even perhaps to some extent, the places they targeted, which were not knocked out sufficiently. So. Uh, that sets the stage for, well, now what do we do? Uh, in addition, the Iranians take extreme umbrage uh, at this attack and uh, go totus porcus, if you will. They use something, for, was it Lord Fisher, for Lord of the Admiralty in the British Navy at the First World War, used to say. And the Israelis feel isolated and they start thinking about, well, maybe we need to use nuclear weapons to show them we're serious. This leads to a demonstration shot and they were hoping that this would cause a, a diplomatic opportunity, a break in the fighting. Well, what do you mean by a demonstration shot? Well, you, if, you, if you pick a place where no one's going to feel the blast and the electromagnetic interference isn't going to scramble very much if you, because you're in the middle of some desolate location in some desolate desert area of Iran, you can make the statement that you're willing to use nuclear weapons without hurting anyone. And that is the first thing the Israelis choose to do. Now, you know, one can debate whether that in fact is what they would do, but the team players decided that, that they wanted to see if they could push Iran to have a, to accept a ceasefire. That does not clearly come back as the message from Tehran in response to that. And what follows is a withdrawal from the NPT along the lines that the North Koreans have done, where you withdraw 
initially for 88 or 89 days. And they've already done that uh, in this scenario. And then the last day you choose to pull out gives you 24 hours notice and then you're out of it. And then they use nuclear weapons themselves. The response is massive. The Israelis use 50 of their weapons and they have a heck of a time knowing what they've done. And the bomb damage assessment is a very difficult, even though they've done as much as they can to be precise in their targeting. I mean, all of this is, you know, uh, make believe. Yeah. But what, what came out of it were a lot of very real questions that you'd want to start struggling with well before anything like this might happen. Mm. Can I just, before we get onto that, just to clarify, so we, we've, got, we've got a team who are playing the Israeli government who decide first on a demonstrative strike somewhere in a desert in Tehran. It doesn't work. Well, in Iran. <laughs> in Iran. Sorry, sorry, not in Tehran, in Iran. It's, it's an important distinction. Tehran is not a desolate desert location at all. But somewhere in a desert. Um, it doesn't work. The Iranians fire their own nuclear weapon at Israel. I mean, what do the Iranians target in this scenario? What do, what do those players choose to target? It's interesting. They go after a base where they know there are sort of Israeli nuclear armed planes and Americans, which then raises another question. In the game, the Israelis take out missile defenses that are manned by Russians. Does Russia and, and does the United States get more engaged and more willing to fight and to support their team in a war when they're hit or not? Does the missile exchanges without nuclear weapons or, or the nuclear weapons catalyze the war to draw more major powers into it or not. It's very unclear. And so the game ends with this huge 50 warhead Israeli strike on Iranian targets, military and nuclear targets. I think they didn't, the, the team didn't choose to strike major cities as far as I'm aware. No, they didn't. And you know, I think I got the wrong here. <laughs> that strike is, is followed by an Iranian strike against that base with a nuclear weapon. I think the question then arises, what will the Israelis do next? We ended the game. As my grandmother would say, enough already. We had enough information to know there were a lot of questions that we didn't have the answers to. And that was the purpose of the game, not to figure out exactly what might happen. But, you know, one of the questions is, you know, would they actually target cities? Tehran. You know, we, we've tried so much since the Second World War to make that, you know, take that off the, the military table of every country. But you'll notice that what's going on in Ukraine, and certainly what's going on in Gaza and what's going on against Israel, seems like the, the civil population centers are, are, are not, not immune to being attacked. It may not be you know, the firebombing of Cologne, Second World War style, but it's still going a bit backwards, if you will, towards uh, civilian targeting. This is all, I mean, I suppose it's a bit trite to say incredibly alarming. It is incredibly alarming. I know it's make-believe, but, you know, you've played this game with, I mean, the players were, who were the players were? Were government officials, military officials? Who was, we're not talking about amateurs here who are doing this. I think, and uh, this is going to sound like uh, a soundbite, I think in these matters, we're all amateurs. <laughs> I mean, the idea that, that there's a professional, stealing, knowledgeable group dealing with these kinds of scenarios may be a mistake to begin with. I think there are just so many things that we just don't know. I don't think this is unique to the Israeli-Iranian conflict. I think, you know, nuclear use between almost any two countries raises just a hornet's nest of uncertainties. Mm. And one of the one of, one of the fascinating conclusions I thought was that the the kind of the decision making fog seems even thicker after this has all happened than before. You talk about how the players are left with almost no tools, no way of kind of working out. Okay, what do we do next? Where do we go next? As you you just talked about the decisions the Americans and the Russians have to make. All of this stuff is this because these kinds of questions just 
haven't been thought about because we spend so much time kind of I don't know, either assuming that nuclear war is impossible or just not wanting to think about it. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> I mean, I think I think it's it's the case that these are not the topics you normally will game with your allies. I know I've tried to engage various military people amongst our closest allies, including, you know, Israel. And there's certain things they just will not talk about. And, and this is this question of nuclear weapons use, certainly in the Israeli case, is definitely one of them. To a lesser extent, I think this is true elsewhere. Now, I, if it was a NATO arrangement, there are so many procedures before there is release. You know, maybe we can scrape by just relying on complex procedures to sort things out before anyone touches the button. I think in the context of the of medium and smaller nations, that filter probably isn't there. Which brings me to another a, a kind of fundamental question. There's a lot of thought that, you know, even if Iran was to get a bomb, perhaps, you know, it wouldn't be a disaster because Israel and Iran would, would basically be locked in a kind of Cold War style deterrence. Yeah. The deterrence would work, that neither would hit each other. Yes. I mean, the assumption of your game is that that doesn't actually work. Of course, that's an assumption you had to make. But I mean, I mean, do you worry that we're a little bit too kind of reliant on that on that thought? Yes. <laughs> First, answer the question. Second, uh, expound on it. If you take a look at the way in which world leaders uh, are talking about nuclear weapons publicly, that ought to be worrisome. In that they are, you have Erdogan saying, well, maybe we need nuclear weapons. If Israel has them, we should have them. You have MBS, the uh, you know, crown, crown prince of Saudi Arabia, saying, well, if Iran gets them where we think they're getting them, we have to get them too. You have Iran saying, well, maybe we will get them, and, we'll le and threatening repeatedly to leave the Nuclear Non Proliferation Treaty, which forbids them from getting it. You have South Korean presidents saying, well, maybe we should get weapons, but not now. And to a lesser extent, the Japanese in this latest campaign for prime minister, you know, at least one of them said, well, we need to get weapons on our soil from the United States or we're going to get them ourselves. This kind of talk is pretty unusual. When you combine it in the case of Israel with people with election certificates, you know, admittedly, they're kind of on the fringe. They're certainly to the right of what we normally consider the Israeli right. But they, these were people with elections to give us not only, you know, making it clear that Israel has these weapons, but suggesting how they should be used against Gaza. That's suggestive that there's a norm that's getting eroded. <laughs> that if Iran and Israel are going to deter one another with nuclear weapons, you wouldn't be hearing or wouldn't want to hear so much of this kind of talk, public talk. I, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, you know, maybe the argument would be, well, because they're, they're threatening one another, it'll make deterrence work. I guess, I don't know whether the glass is half full or half empty on this proposition, but what has changed is there's more public discussion of use. I think on balance, I don't like that. Maybe because I'm a scaredy cat. I mean, I don't know. It seems to me that if, if deterrence depends on making public threats to do pretty dastardly things, that's not a real comforting prospect. You know, you're not the first person we've had on saying that. We spoke to, uh, to Raphael Grossi, the head of the IAEA, some months ago, who, who basically said the same thing. He was saying that this rhetoric, it just kind of, it begins to normalize the concept in people's heads. That's the worrying thing. Once you start talking about it as, as almost something that you can talk about it as an option that can be discussed. But but think about it. I, here I am recommending we have public uh, simulations. So at some level, um, I, I, I seem to think my my proposition is on both sides of, of, this, of this fence. You know, also, you, you bring up a, another thing which we don't like talking at all about if you, any more than this. You know, Mr. Grossi heads an organization that promotes the construction, development, and operation 
of reactors that can that can and do make the materials to make bombs. I have not heard that organization talk about how sensible that might be in places like Eastern Europe and the Koreas and India and Pakistan and in the Middle East. You, you don't you, you have to that is apparently not part of the remit. And yet they have views about nuclear war. Well, okay, but I mean, come on. Are we taking this seriously enough to kind of consider all the, the key components and connect the dots? Or are we just like, you know, well, I guess we all like press opportunities. I mean, who doesn't like to be interviewed? But I, I don't know how serious we are about the, the, the variety of subjects that are closely related to one another with regard to the prospect of nuclear weapons and their use. Thank you very much for that. I've just got a couple more questions and they're kind of they're kind of specifically related to the game. I mean, the first one, I'm interested in that there's that key prior assumption in the scenario you paint, which is that the Israelis feel compelled to consider nuclear use largely because the Americans don't want to get involved. They don't want to get dragged into a regional war. They they want everyone to de-escalate. And therefore, the Israelis end up feeling isolated and like they've they've got no choice but to to use their weapon of last resort in kind of you know sowing that thought into the game is that i don't know i mean do you do you have a view on on how the united states is managing the current crisis is is that a kind of suggestion that america should be taking a a more robust role rather than constantly calling for for escalation in the middle east the escalation sorry in de-escalation, I was going to say, I, I think they're calling it for the latter. I, my guess is, is that it's Israel is it's like like a wolf that you hold by the ears. You, you don't want to let it go, but it, it's not fun holding the ears either. And that's not where Israel should want to be. I'm sure there are a lot of people in Israel that are uncomfortable with this, but the United States certainly is a major supplier. I was stunned to discover that we have sold Israel much more in the way of arms in the last 12 months than we have Ukraine. So we're a major supplier, and I think they know that. So, you know, at some level, we're connected pretty, pretty, you know, intimately. I think a lot of Western Europe has been supportive of Israel. And, you know, there's a lot to argue for doing that. But at what point does that connection constitute leverage to shape behavior on these questions? I don't know. I think that may be the reason why some discussion of these things now publicly might be a good thing. We'll see see what the markets will bear. But, yeah, I think Israel increasingly uh, is of the view that it's not a complex, and that's not healthy. Do you, do, do you think, you know, Israeli officials are talking about strikes on preemptive strikes on Iranian nuclear facilities? They're talking about doing it this week, maybe in response to Iran's latest strike. What would your advice be? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? We all like to think that we have the answers to every question. My guess is whatever they do will not damage the program as much as anyone would want. So it's a, it's a kind of messaging thing. And it may be why nothing has happened yet. I mean, it should have, some people thought it would have happened by now. Yeah. So clearly there's debate going on. There are a lot of reasons why you might not want to do that. You can tell I am not answering your question and it isn't because <laughs> I don't want to. It's because I, I, I'm not sure anyone's equipped to answer that very well. And that that's, Part of the reason, again, why I think having more discussion about these things probably would be helpful. Mm. Thank you very much. For the benefit of listeners, we're speaking on the well, the evening in the UK, the afternoon of the 8th of October. Well, that's Tuesday this week. And by the time you hear this podcast, it's possible Israel will have done something in response to that Iranian strike. We will, we will update you appropriately if that occurs well sure sure i mean I, I the the question of israel's security 
no longer is something necessarily all that local. <laughs> I think a lot of people outside of the region are watching and keeping score. And therein lies a bigger problem than what we're talking about. Mm. Let's let's finish with that with that question we kind of began with, with this this amerta, this interesting amerta around Israeli nuclear weapons. I suppose the Israelis have their reasons for for never acknowledging officially that they've got them. Why do you think that is? And more interestingly, perhaps, why do you think it is that the United States also refuses to talk about it? Your, the article you wrote, you wrote an article in February in the Washington Post saying it's time to ditch that policy. What's the purpose of that policy? I'll be honest. I'm not, not a big fan of it. I wrote a piece in the New York Times with uh, my mentor, Victor Galinsky, many years before uh, the latest uh, thing that was written and I think the I think we've lost the plot as to why and I can understand why we did not want to make it public in the 60s because if we said well that they have nuclear weapons the Russians Soviets would be under tremendous pressure to help Egypt get them. the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore I, that problem is not the, not the one that we're addressing any longer. I think in addition, while it might be in Israel's interest to keep this under wraps, I don't see how it makes much sense for the United States any longer to do so. The Israelis are very insistent, however, that the United States pledge that it won't raise this specter of them having nuclear weapons or discuss how those weapons should be reduced in number or limited in any fashion. And there are actual letters that each president of the United States, including Clinton forward, have signed uh, almost like the first day of their service that the Israelis bring and ask them to sign. I think, actually, oddly enough, Trump would came closest to saying, well, I don't want to sign it. It might be a good thing that we, we don't sign that anymore. Mm. And I, I, I think we've lost the plot. I think everyone who is, you know, keen on, on Israel's survival or believes we should sign the letter and should never speak of it. And I don't know if you're in favor of their security. That's a complete thought. I would think at this point, it might be best if you're interested in everyone and their security as well, not to continue to make this a, I guess you would call it an open secret. You know, it's secret, but I mean, who in the world thinks they don't have nuclear weapons? The game and this conversation is a preview of a world in which if Iran goes nuclear, Saudi Arabia will go nuclear, Turkey will go nuclear, I would think Egypt would go nuclear, maybe the UAE, and I, you know at least South Korea and probably Japan. It's difficult to know how the story ends. We know how it begins. I think it begins here. Henry Sikorsky, thank you very much. Battle Lines is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all our news, analysis and dispatches from the ground in Israel and Gaza, subscribe to The Telegraph or sign up to Dispatches, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from contributors to this podcast. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Battle Lines on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. As disinformation is a particular problem during conflict, we're relying on your support more than ever. Battle Lines is part of wider Telegraph foreign coverage and our podcasts. If you're interested in finding out more about the war in Ukraine, you can listen to Battle Lines' sister podcast, Ukraine, the latest. This episode of Battle Lines was produced by David Dargahi and executive produced by Louisa Wells and David Knowles. <laughs>